I'm Father Robert Lawton, president of Loyola Marymount University, a university proud and fortunate to be in Los Angeles. I've been lucky enough to live much of my life in great world cities. I grew up on the East Coast, lived in Washington, New York, Boston. Then I moved to Europe, lived in Munich and Berlin, Florence and Rome. All these are great world cities, but they're old as great world cities. And I used to think sometimes when I was in them, what would it have been like to live in one of these cities when it was in its youth as a great world city? Well, now I get that chance. Los Angeles is a great world city, arguably the great world city, and yet it's in its youth, or maybe in its adolescence, full of optimism and energy and hope and great spirit. And so in studying this great and wonderful city, we're studying not only the city itself, but the modern world, because that's what great cities do. They live very intensely, the modern world. And in a city like Los Angeles, uh, it also lives the future as well. The future feels closer in Los Angeles than anywhere else. So this urban lecture series studies the city, but it studies our world, it studies our future. I hope that you enjoy today's lecture. Okay, welcome to the urban lecture series sponsored by the uh, Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University, also co-sponsored by LA36. Um, we have a, a great panel today. Uh, it's gonna, we're going to talk about transportation and infrastructure and the building of Los Angeles. Uh, we have with us some people who have been involved for a long time in the building of Los Angeles, the physical building of Los Angeles. Uh, right next to me is Richard Katz. He is currently a board member of the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. He has a long history of public service. He served on the California State Water Resources Control Board, a very powerful board. Uh, before that, he was Governor Gray Davis's senior advisor on energy and water, and he led uh, negotiations on behalf of California for the landmark Colorado River Agreement with the U.S. government. Uh, he also served 16 years in the state legislature, uh, beginning in 1980, and for 10 years he was the chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee. So he's been involved in transportation for a long time, and because we have traffic and it's all been messed up, we can blame him for all that time. Uh, he created the congestion management plan requiring cities and counties to mitigate land use decisions, and we'll talk a lot about that, linking land use and transportation. Um, he right now has his own private consulting uh, practice, and he was appointed by uh, Mayor Villaragosa not only to the MTA board, but also to the Metrolink board after the crisis, not before. And so, in part, he is a, a fixer when uh, issues happen. Uh, mayors, governors, and others call upon him for his expertise to come in and, and fix it up since he helped mess it up when he was in the assembly. So, this is uh, Richard Katz. Sort of a full employment thing. We yeah, full employment scene. <laughs> First he messed it up, and then he yeah, says, then hey, he I, can, I, can, I can help you uh, uh, fix it. Um, next to uh, him is Assistant General Manager and Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Gilbert Ivey. Um, he is the Interim Chief Executive Officer for the Metropolitan Water District, an incredible retailer of water for our, our region. He is the chief liaison to the board chairman and its directors. He is responsible for managing the administrative functions of the district, including the office of the board of directors, human resources, management of the real estate property, and the award-winning business outreach program. Uh, he joined the Metropolitan 35 years ago as a summer trainee. So think about that. And he's now in, in this position that he is. I've handed out a uh, resume for you guys to read about him and all his other accolades, so I won't go much into that. Um, so let me start off. We're going to talk about transportation and infrastructure. And uh, Richard, why is there so much traffic in LA? <laughs> Too many people going to the same place. So you, you could, actually, you know, the irony, and it's, it's not a good solution, but if you notice, Traffic seems better these days in Los Angeles than it has been for a while uh, because there's nothing that cures congestion like a good recession. Unfortunately, it's not a good long-term strategy. That's right. You know, and, and, and higher gas prices. And higher gas prices. When gas prices went up, growth in mass transit went up, ridership went up. You know, in the Valley, we have something called the Orange Line, which is a uh, ra rapid bus system that we put in about two years ago that was projected to have 5,000 boardings at the beginning. It had 11,000 the first day. 
It hit 26,000 last December, which was 15 years ahead of the projection, which just does show that people in LA will use mass transit if it's there. The problem with our city is that there is nowhere in the world that's as dense or as sprawled, and certainly not dense and sprawled as LA is. The greater LA area sort of starts at the coast over here and goes to San Bernardino and, the, uh, and starts at Castaic Landing in the north and sort of goes to Oceanside. And this town developed without adequate transportation facilities being built at the same time. So we are paying for mistakes that were made in the 70s and continue in the 80s and trying now to build transportation systems to where people already are. In an ideal world, you build them to where you want the growth to be. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in LA, we're doing that backwards. Let me um, introduce right now Wendy Gruel. Uh, Speaking of bad traffic, uh, <laughs> Wendy, from the Valley, yes. Wendy Gruel is president pro tem of the Los Angeles City Council. That means she's number two in the uh, city council. She's a council member in the second district. Recently, this past March, she was elected to be city controller, which is a, a citywide um, uh, uh, position. Uh, we asked her here because of her overall policy expertise, but also she's currently the chair of the Transportation Committee of the City of Los Angeles that deals with a lot of the issues that we're talking about. And so I've handed out a long uh, resume about Wendy, so I won't spend much more time about that, uh, but we have all kinds of questions for her. Uh, we asked Richard Katz why we have so much traffic and what the problem is, and he said it's the problem of the City of Los Angeles and Department of Transportation and the lack of leadership. The chair of Transportation. The chair of Transportation. So thank you uh, for joining us, Wendy. So um, Richard, you, you, you're going to have to leave us a little bit early. Right. And that's because you are going to go w tell the students where you're going. Well, we're actually we're making a change at the MTA. We have our CEO is retiring, and tonight is a farewell for him after eight years at the agency. We're bringing in a new CEO starting on Monday. And, uh, and I need to make a presentation at that downtown. But it's really an important time of change for the agency. And one of the things I wanted to mention, you know, we talked before about the planning. You know, the reason, we're, the reason we have so many cars in L.A. is, one, we are called car culture, and that's never going to change. Uh, we can get people out of cars, and we need to get as many as we can. But people who came to L.A. and continue to come here, you come here because in January you can have the top down on your car. I mean, you know, everywhere in the country is congested. But if you're going to be stuck in traffic, would you rather be stuck in traffic in L.A. in January or Rochester in January or Chicago in January or Cleveland or Atlanta or any of those other places? And when all said and done, it's probably still one of the premierest places to live in the world from a cultural standpoint, from a diversity standpoint, and an opportunity. So people are here. And everyone who wishes that a third of the people would just disappear has to get over that. Mm -hmm. And we need to deal with it better. Now, one thing that I do want to say and thank all of you who were eligible and voted yes on Measure R last November, people in the county of Los Angeles voted to tax themselves by a half percent, an additional half percent. Did that come effective yesterday? It becomes effective July 1st. Oh, so July in addition 1st. to the increase that we had yesterday, <laughs> you're yeah. going to get another one. Okay. Yeah. So right. ours is a smaller one. <laughs> yeah. And ours is dedicated to transportation only. It's controlled locally. Sacramento can't rip it off. Uh, D.C. can't rip it off. And there's a plan that the voters approved. And what it said to what the people were saying is they were far ahead of a lot of elected officials. Uh, people like Wendy who were out front on this, along with Mayor Villaraigosa, Supervisor Yaroslavsky, were in tune with where a lot of the public was coming from. But some elected officials were saying, I don't want to support this because it doesn't build enough in my backyard. The public sort of understands that it really doesn't matter whose backyard it is, it's how do we solve the problem. And when I'm driving down Sepulveda, somewhere between rolling hills and the north end of the San Fernando Valley, I don't care what jurisdiction I'm in. I just know I'm not going anywhere. And so Measure R is designed to try and fix that. The other thing we have to overcome. You don't, you don't think a lot of voters supported this because they want mass transit so that everybody else will take it and then their car can oh. go faster? Right. No, listen, no, no. You, you, know, you and I have talked about this. You know, when I used to do a lot of speeches, I used to say people in Los Angeles support mass transit so that Fernando uses it to get out of my way on the freeway. And they're still part of that. The other thing, though, that we have to overcome, and this is where all you guys become really important in this, the other thing that makes it hard in Los Angeles is everyone says, I'm all for mass transit, but I'm only going to use it if it's convenient. Now, I define convenient as a stop being within two blocks of my house. And by the way, I will oppose it if you build it in my backyard. 
which I define as anything within three blocks of my house. And people don't seem to think that's a contradiction. We have to get past that. And we have to do a better job of making it possible for folks to, who want to use mass transit. The Measure R plan is a $40 billion, 30-year plan that will build, you know, it will do the other, the carpool lane on the 405. It will do Expo light rail from USC to the beach. It will do the subway. It will extend the subway down Wilshire through all the way as far as Westwood initially. It will tie an idea that Wendy Gruhl has been working on for a couple of years now a Van Nuys Civic Center to Westwood rail that will run parallel to 405. It will repair local streets and roads. All that is part of Measure R. All the different aspects of transportation are in. Yes. You can find them and not only the different aspects but different regions are impacted by this. Spread out through the entire county of Los Angeles. So what, going back to Roger Snowball who is leaving and then you hired a new person yep. and you were intimately involved with this. In class, we've talked about what we, what we say is the uh, uh, progressive public policy paradigm, where we talk about to solve a problem, we typically define the issue as technical, we then hire a technician. The classic is Mulholland or people like that. What is the, then we give them political and fiscal autonomy, which the MTA has from the county and the city, that their budgets don't go through those. As a matter of fact, it goes the other way around. And, and it's a different political body, not the council, not the supervisors. Um, and then you give them a tangible target, meaning build a rail, build the expo line, build something. Um, what is the criteria for hiring a technician in today's political environment? What was it that you were looking for when you went out to go hire the new person? And talk about that criteria number one, the process number two, and why this person that you cho chose, Leahy, is the one. Yeah, we, we sort of joke that the people smart enough to run the MTA are too smart to take the job uh, because it is a difficult agency to run. It is a huge responsibility and you know, spending $40 billion responsibly and making sure projects get done on time, on budget, with sufficient neighborhood input and participation so that it's not an adversarial situation is hard to do. So we set out to look for someone who had a track record of building things and, and forging consensus. The board of the MTA is made up of four people appointed by the mayor of Los Angeles, of which the mayor is one, I'm a second. Uh, Rita Robinson, who is the general manager at DOT in LA, is the third, and Councilman Weizar was just added as the fourth. Uh, there are the five members of the Board of Supervisors, and then four people, each representing a quarter of the independent cities in the county of LA. So you have a very, very strong-willed, very political uh, board to begin with. So you now, need who, who created that board? Uh, somebody who should remain <laughs> nameless. Um, now, I, I merged. Richard two, Katz. Yeah, it, was, it was my fault. That's why I have to serve on it, it now. It's sort of penance for having created it. Um, the, but the, what we did is we merged two boards that were not acting compatibly. Correct. You have the RTD doing the bus system and the LACTC doing rail, and they would go to Washington and ask for money for knowing that they couldn't both build the same thing. They'd each try and build something different so they could each get federal funding, which meant they were building stuff that wasn't compatible, which makes no sense whatsoever. That's why we merged the agencies to have more accountability. And, and I'll tell you, there, there were two things that I missed in putting it together that I underestimated. One was the rivalry at a staff level between the RTD and the, MT, and the LACTC, which carried over into the new agency. Mm -hmm. And I was overly optimistic about the ability of elected officials to look beyond their own parochial interests. I expect elected officials to look out for their district because that's what we get elected to do. But I also expect them on the, art, on the MTA board, I was, more, I was hoping that they would say, okay, I've got to take care of my area, but maybe things outside my area benefit my area too because, you know, air quality doesn't stay in districts. Congestion doesn't stay in districts. Uh, I, live in this, I live in Sherman Oaks, and, you know, the Ventura Freeway is a nightmare. The project that could fix the Ventura Freeway or help the Ventura Freeway and the 405-101 more than anything else is not something in Sherman Oaks. It happens to be in Pasadena. If you do the 710 freeway gap closure in Pasadena, it gives people an alternative to get to the east side of downtown without going through downtown. That takes 20% of the traffic out of downtown, and the ripple from that that's is all the way to the 101, 405, the 10, the 405. That's a good idea. Why don't you know, we do that? We've been trying for 35 oh, years okay. to do that, and 2,500 people <laughs> in South Pasadena have tied it up. It's crazy, but I mean, that from an air quality standpoint, mobility standpoint, 
you know, let me just. We'll go back to the criteria the for criteria. selecting and then why, why uh, Leahy. Leahy actually, Leahy's very interesting. He was a bus driver in our system. His parents worked for the old RTD. This is in his blood. He worked for us for almost uh, uh, 20 years, I believe, including director of operations. Actually got fired by an interim CEO, left there and went to Minnesota where he had an outstanding track record and for the last eight years has been running the Orange County Transportation Authority where they have built a lot of stuff on time, under budget, builds consensus with a difficult board, and tries to move the ball. What, I'll tell you, one of the things that impressed me the most about Leahy in the interview process was he was excited about the challenge. You, know, we, you, you have people who say, look, I can do this because my career is over and this will be the last thing, it'll be the crowning. I want someone who's hungry, I want someone who's energetic, someone who's gonna push the envelope and push the staff. You know, the staff is a reflection of what your CEO does. And if your CEO is not hungry, the staff's going to coast because the staff will figure, why should I stick my neck out if the CEO is not sticking their neck out? Leahy meets those criteria. What's the budget of MTA? MTA budget, well, with all the transfer, I mean, we will spend over, you know, $100 billion over a 10-year period, including, tr including projects. <laughs> we, we have a lot of money to spend. Uh, you know, the $40 billion over the next 30 years that comes from Measure R is just one component. We get state funding and gas tax funding. But in L.A., by the way, those $40 billion worth of projects are half of the NMET need for transportation in L.A. County. In most places in the world, you spend $40 billion, you're going to solve most of the problems, but not in Los Angeles and California. So, Wendy, let me go to you, and we'll, Gil will talk about the MWD in a second, but since we're on transportation, you are the chair of the Transportation Committee for the City of Los Angeles. Um, how do you interact with the MTA, and how, how does that process work? Has it been frustrating? Is it compatible? Uh, what's the deal there? Well, um, I think the, actually the relationship between the city and MTA um, has gotten better over the years. Um, a, a long we're time over, ago. We're overrepresented. The city of Los Angeles is overrepresented on the N MTA board. I don't know if I said overrepresented. I'd say underrepresented, wouldn't you, Richard? Richard yeah, is one of the city. Those of us in the city think we're underrepresented. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> if you, you saw during the Measure R and putting it on the ballot, um, there was a very contentious debate um, within the MTA as to who would get how much money and was the city of Los Angeles getting too much of that money. But when you talk about where the major traffic is in, in this region, you talk about the 405 where I was um, for a good long period of time today. You talk about the 101 and the 10 and the 110. Those are really where the bottlenecks occur. Um, and so for the uh, city of Los Angeles, the MTA is a partner and it's a funder. Um, we go to them and we ask our representatives like Richard Katz, um, who is, is really the perfect person to be on the MTA board with his history, go to them and say, here are projects within the city of Los Angeles that we think need to be in included. And we go to the MTA and say, here's a list of projects, whether it be those that we wanted to have um, recipients of Measure R and that sales tax, whether it is economic stimulus dollars that are coming forward to the call for projects that say, how are we going to move ahead? The city of Los Angeles, people assume that we have responsibility for the freeways and for the buses and for the subway and the trains. That's not what the city of Los Angeles is responsible for. We're responsible for your streets and your lights and the dash buses and the commuter buses, but we are not responsible for those other things. But people think we are, um, just like a lot of people think we're responsible for the schools and we're not. Um, and so uh, it really behooves us to have that close relationship between the MTA and Caltrans to get the projects that we think are really important, i.e. the subway to the sea, the gold line, the expo line, having a north-south line in the San Fernando Valley. And most of these lines actually go through the city of LA first. It's, it's the hub really and then they go out. But even the expo line, I've heard rumors that the expo line has been having trouble with LA DOT in terms of trying to get uh, some of the intersections ready for the construction and a lot. So that even sometimes that doesn't work very well. Well, we have the orange line in the San Fernando Valley, for example, and the intersections that are responsible to the city and the synchronization of those lights and the, the coordination is really, again, going back to it being a, a, a partnership. Um, with the, the Expo line, I haven't heard that specifically that they're I not, just made it and up, if it I'm is, just... if that is true, you know, Richard and our ears perked up to say, okay, and do I need to call Rita Robinson, who is the, a new member. That's a great appointment, uh, though. To it was a, a very good appointment. Yeah. It's the first time, I believe, the mayor recently put 
two new people, as, as Mr. Richard mentioned, uh, Jose Wiesar from the east side, a council member, and the other was Rita Robinson, who is the um, general manager of the Department of Transportation. Um, and, and I don't remember a time where you actually had the general manager from the department in the city of Los Angeles serving on that board who understands the, the relationships there. Let me deviate a little bit and ask you a couple of political questions. Today's sure. Thursday. What were you doing last week at this time? What was I doing last week at this time? Wow. <laughs> you already forgot. I have, what? Have you Do seen you remember or did I see? Yeah, I was going to say. I'm, We're being roasted at. Oh, last. Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> I was roasted. I some of the jokes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Richard roasted me. I was. Um, so they I, was gonna, a, I was actually going to ask Richard to repeat one or two of those. No. Just one. The uh, Remember we're on television. <laughs> That's why we can't. We were, yeah, it was taped too. The American Diabetes Association has a political roast every year for the last 12 years, and they roast a particular elected official. And um, Why did you say yes? I used to say, it's, in some ways you say, that's an honor that they would select me. And then when you're sitting on the stage and they're saying lots of jokes about you um, at your expense, um, you think twice about it. What was the funniest joke that they said about you? <laughs> I can't repeat that on the, on the TV. <laughs> what was the funniest joke that you could repeat on television? It's wow. sort of thin, actually. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Richard, which one would you well, they say? Did, they, they, did do a, they did do a skit around, they did um, a skit around. around the commercial Wendy had done that, that criticized a, a contract for public employees on ah, teaching yes. breathing exercises and a variety of things like that. And uh, Tina Troy came out and um, showed Wendy how to do some meditation and breathing exercises and ripped on that for a little yeah, bit. But. They also had a video. I, I, they sit you up on a stage um, and they put you on some kind of throne. Okay, depends. One year, the mayor was up there in an um, airplane, you know, a seat um, because he had taken a free ride from He the, travels a lot. That's right. Yeah, well, that wasn't it that time, but it was an AmeriQuest. He took in a free flight and it became right. controversial, so they had a big thing that he sat in that was... Request. I'm known as the pothole queen in the city of Los Angeles um, because I think it's important for us to keep our streets paved. Um, and I got this nickname because I went out and actually filled a pothole and paved it. So they. Or did you wear one of those orange suits? No, they recreated a pothole on the stage um, and had cones around it and then gave me a tiara um, as the pothole queen um, sitting on the stage. <laughs> um, they also, you know, gave me a hard time about my driving habits um, and my coffee drinking. Oh, and, uh, and, and uh, don't occasion, occasionally Wendy has a habit of mentioning that she worked for Tom Bradley. Yes. Uh, and that was that was the subject of some that of was that. A, yes. Uh. <laughs> if you didn't know I worked for Tom Bradley. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they repeated it several times. Several times, yes. So um, what, what, you are now. We'll tell you the other jokes later when the cameras are off. Okay. You are now controller elect. Um, when I first met you, you said that being the council member of the second district was the greatest job that anybody could have. So why is controller a better job than that? Um, I'm not sure if it's a better job. It's, it's a good job, too. Uh, they're both they pay more? great. It does pay more. Um, but if I really, if the pay was important, I would have stayed at DreamWorks Movie Studios, which I got paid a lot more and had a whole private life. Um, uh, but it's not for the money, it's for the, the cause, as, as Richard knows, as a previously elected, a former, as he was given a hard time at the roast, that he has a lot of formers next to his name. Um, and uh, the city controller, uh, when I said I was running for city controller, people had two questions. One, what does the city controller do? How many of you thought that? Okay. Oh, come on. All right. Yeah, be honest. See, it took you a moment. And then two, when you describe to them what the city controller does, they said, why would you ever want that job during a tough economic crisis? So and what so, does the city controller so the city do? Contro I was getting there. See, Fernando knows my story here. The, um, the city controller does a couple of things. One is we audit um, in the city. We do both performance audits and fiscal audits, which really means you can ask a question about how the city can run more efficiently any question you want on any city department and be able to identify where the problem is. You also are the fiscal agent for the city of Los Angeles. And so that you are able uh, to uh, make sure that uh, when you're paying the bills, when the contracts are being let out, when um, you are, are looking at our cash flow. Someone described it yesterday to me as the, um, you're both the savings account and the checking account. 
um, but you don't always have control over that. Um, in the savings account, I have the money, but someone else invests it, but we are responsible for it. In the checking account, the city council and the mayor decide how they think they want to spend it, and I have to make sure that it's actually balanced um, as we go forward. Um, and so uh, Laura Chick has done a great job as a city controller about using the bully pulpit to say, how can we run Los Angeles more effectively and more efficiently? And in the city of LA, as in many bureaucracies, there's resistance to change in big bureaucracies. And uh, I remember when I was at the federal government, and they said to me when I arrived at HUD working for Henry Cisneros. Uh, she didn't was only the, work for Tom Bradley. Uh, exactly. she, also worked, she also worked for um, Henry Cisneros. For, sure. And someone said to me, we were here before you came, and we'll be here when you're gone. That was their attitude when I asked them to do something. That and sounds that like a, prof a tenured professor. A tenured LMU. professor. See, same thing. And so um, it happens in the city as well. But when you have the threat, the potential, as we do in the city of Los Angeles right now, when we have a, a over $500 million budget deficit projected for this next year in a $6 billion budget, when we're talking about having to, to balance that to lay off 4,800 employees, guess what? They're willing to change the status quo if they get to keep their job and do things differently. And so this is, that's why it's one of the best times to be as the city controller, because some of the ideas that had been thrown out there in the past, people poo-pooed, said, no, not going to happen. We now can actually uh, implement. Okay, back to transportation. If there was one reform that you could wave a magic wand in terms of transportation in Los Angeles, what would that be? And then, number two, back to reality, how could we try to attain that? Do you want to start that first, Richard? You could ask them the... <laughs> well, you know, one, I, I would guess yeah. if, if there was one reform, I'm not sure people would No, but you're, you're the guy that continues to reform, and we still and keep messing up. Anywhere. I mean, every By single... Way, but let me ask a question. How many, of you were, how many of you were not born in Los Angeles County? Okay, oh. so when you wonder who came here to cause all the problems on the freeways... Uh, <laughs> look around. The, you guys are all, and, and but the reason I say that, and by the way, those th that percentage is pretty, pretty consistent. No matter whether you talk to a chamber group or anybody else. But part of the reason I, I mention that is that there is no silver bullet that is going to make this better. One thing where silver bullet is that high speed rail. Silver bullet. In it, there's no silver bullet, high speed rail or otherwise, that's going to make it work. In Los Angeles, it's going to be a combination. Some of you are going to take. So listen, he's, he, he's an elected, former elected official. We asked, is there one reform? <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> one reform. And in, okay. I'll tell you the one reform. One reform. The one reform is if you wanted to fix it quickly, to have the power that Robert Moses had. When Explain he who Robert Moses is. Robert Moses was the, was the architect of modern day New York. Uh, pre sequa pre-environmental laws, pre-NIMBYs. Uh, Pre all that stuff, sort of though he was the New York version of William Mulholland, if you will, right. though some years later. If there was, if if you could have a an individual who had the authority to look at things and say, you know, the 710 gap closure serves a whole lot more than South Pasadena, and it has to be done. I mean, that would fix this. That's not real. It's not going to happen, and it's not happen. practical. A, so, a dictatorship, um, in benevolent, some though. Benevolent, 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 benevolent. benevolent. Um, I, I think it's right because there are a lot of projects that could be happening today if it wasn't for some of the delays related to the reform of, of uh, how long it takes you to get through a, a particular process. I like to say, okay, I'm going to mention Tom Bradley again, but in, Tom Bradley in 1973 when he first got elected said, I'm going to, 18 months, I'm going to start construction of a subway in the city of Los Angeles. And the only thing he had right was 18 but it was 18 years before it actually happened. And in an LA, as, as Richard mentioned earlier, we are a car culture. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. I had bought my car before I turned 16. The day I turned 16, I got my license and was driving that day. That's where we have, have come from. But people in Los Angeles, there's not a seamless system. You can't, for me to get here today, I came from the San Fernando Valley. The only option I had was coming the 405 either by carpool lane um, or it was driving my vehicle. There's no bus that came very quickly that would have not taken me the whole day. There was no rail line that got me here, nothing like that. One reform. <laughs> if everyone in this class and in the city of LA would commit to taking public transportation one day a week, 
or stay one home. day a week, or stay home, or telecommute one day a week, we'd all think we died and went to heaven. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's true. And you look today, I don't know, I mean, even though there's an accident on the 405, driving normal. That person would have stayed home today. Well, that would have stayed home. <laughs> but. He will tomorrow. <laughs> Private, yes. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Private schools are out this week. I have a kindergartner, so I kind of, so all my friends' kids who are in private school, they're all out this week. And guess what? It takes me, instead of half hour to 45 minutes to get downtown every day this week, it has taken me 20 minutes. That's because you don't have to drop your kid off. Yeah, no, no, my kid's still in school. I dropped him off. But it is all the others who were in private school. He's in public school. He's in public school. He's in public school. In right. private schools. So next week, you guys have spring break next week? No, we, it's like, oh, Ka Pat, Cabo sorry. was two weeks, I mean, spring break was two weeks yeah. ago. Oh, Cabo, I heard the Cabo. Yeah. So spring break is next week for, <laughs> we know where you went. Um, uh, spring break for LA Unified School District is next week. Guess what? Traffic is going to be great. Jewish holidays, okay? Richard and my husband off on Jewish holidays. Guess what? It's better those days too. So it tells you that... So Ephraim's Jews are the problem to traffic. <laughs> <in Israel. laughs> or more Jewish holidays are the solution. Jewish That's it. But, but, but it's, it's, you know, again, what it demonstrates... What it demonstrates. This is a serious class. Wendy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You could have been at the roast last week. It demonstrates that the roast. it does just take a little bit of change in people's behaviors. This last summer, gas prices four dollars, five dollars an hour. I mean, five dollars an hour, four and five dollars a gallon, and we saw traffic whoosh, go down like this. Unfortunately, during an economic crisis. Over a 12 percent unemployment rate. Guess what? That's also an indicator of why we have less traffic. So um, and so the, the, the lesson in that is if each of us, one day a week. Now again, I how do we get there though? I mean, I agree, and we've heard that, and I think it's a great idea. But we've been I've heard this same statement for over 20 years. How do we get? How do we change the culture for at least one day a week? Well, the system. Sorry, the, the system is greater than it was 20 years ago. So, for example, the Blue Line. You live in Long Beach. You actually can now get to downtown. If I go to the aquarium on a on a, a Saturday with my son in Long Beach, taking this. If I I could take the Blue Line to get down there. Um, during the week, I might not be able to in my schedule take the subway, but that my one day would be that Sunday. If you are going down to a, a, a meeting and you have enough time, you take the bus that one day. It doesn't necessarily have to be every week. Every, it's just making a point. How many of you take public transportation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some yeah, of you and now. One, and one of those little carts from here to Upper Campus doesn't, doesn't count. count. <laughs> and, and these are some of the students who I've seen a couple of them actually drive from Upper Campus and park under U-Haul. So it's like, Ooh. this is but, not... Uh, but it is, uh, it is also, though, you know, the younger generation, um, maybe even younger than you guys, but is teaching them that taking public transportation is okay. Um, in my day, you would never, except for going the beach bus from the valley when I couldn't drive, you would have never taken the bus to go somewhere. Now it is, it's more acceptable. People are doing it for different parts of the city. Others depend on it, um, and we need to make it a much better system. I think part of it, in answering your question, though, is also, I, I think everyone is just sitting in this room saying, okay, but if I just do it the one day a week, will it really make that much of a difference? I mean, how do I as an individual make that kind of a difference? And what's interesting, going back to what Wendy was saying, uh, when you think about it, it is Jewish holidays that the traffic is good. Um, but also, you know, the, the last time traffic was really good in L.A. was long before you guys were born. It was 1984 during the Olympics. And, you know, that, it tells you something when... How many of you were born before, a, in 1984? Yeah. Oh, see? Two, three, okay. <laughs> but oh, it, it tells you something when the last good day we remember was in 1984. <laughs> but here's the important part, and, what, and, and speaking to why you can make a difference. We didn't take 50% of the cars off the road in 1984. We didn't take 40% or 30% or 20%. We had 5% of the cars were off the road, and everybody thought it was the greatest system in the world. So when we talk about everyone doing one day a week, that's a 20% reduction on the average. So if we can convince people, one, we have to continue to build the system so it actually takes you where you want to go. But second, that you are making a difference both in relieving congestion and improving air quality uh, by taking mass transit or telecommuting, when a bus or a train or a bike, whatever it may be, you as an individual are making a difference. And every friend you can get to do that is making a difference. Let me, let me end this and then transition over to water. Political will. 
okay, because if we were discussing in class, in London, if you drive into town, you are taxed. In Mexico City, some, uh, during smog season, those who have license plates that end in an even number cannot drive on certain days. And so we have, you can simply dictate and say, you know, people with certain license plates that end in certain letters can't drive on these days. And you can, uh, you can achieve what you're talking about, have one-fifth of cars just not have, be out there. Why don't politicians do that? And we, we had that during the gas crisis uh, in the 70s. Right. During the gas crisis, even plates filled up on one day, odd plates filled up on another day. Uh, so we've done it before because politicians today, in my view, one of the things we, you know, we, we always, you hear a lot of talk in this country about are, the are you Are you listening, Wendy? Are you excluding except me? Except for Wendy. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> You hear a lot of talk in this country about the entrepreneurial spirit and risk-taking and how good it is. And we think that's good in everything except our elected officials. If our elected officials go out there and do something, they take a position that's controversial and we disagree with it, we tend to shoot them. And not literally, but um, we tend to defeat them at, all, at the office. We tend to not reward the fact they took the risk. We tend to punish them for taking the risk. I can't tell you how many times when I was in the legislature, I had colleagues say to me, Look, I know I should vote on this. It's a tough vote. It's an important vote. But, you know, I want to be here to vote on the other 99 things we voted on today as well. And the reality is anyone could have voted on the other 99. The reason you run for office, and I've seen Wendy do this time and time again, is to cast that one hard vote because that's the one that makes a difference. I think if you want politicians to show more uh, leadership and more guts, we have to support their ability to make decisions, and we don't always have to agree with them but we want them to make tough decisions. We, we don't let that happen anymore. Wendy? I, I just want to uh, respond. And, and two years ago, prior to me running for city controller, I did a poll um, citywide and asked a question, asked questions related, related to transportation, and listed, you know, what's your most important issue in the city of Los Angeles? And the top two were public transportation, were transportation and public safety. And when we asked them, Okay, so if transportation is such an important issue, what would you be willing to do to help solve it? First one was, would you pay more? That was a definite no. The second one was, would you change your own behaviors? You know, or home behavior? No. Would you be willing to do congestion pricing, which means, you know, those lanes where um, uh, you have lanes. to, you pay, Lexus lanes, what they call them. Um, would you uh, be willing to do what you just talked about in Mexico City, which was odd and even, you know, that one was hell no. Forget it. We're not going to do it. And the difference between two years ago and November, what, um, that when Measure R passed and Measure R was people realized and they had said, you know what, we're willing to look at this because traffic has gotten so bad. And they were ahead of the politicians. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, on congestion pricing, which is going to take effect on the 110 freeway and a federal grant that the city worked with the MTA to get. Um, it was going to be on another freeway, but the pol politician said, no, we're not going to do that because people said, well, how, that's not going to take away anything for poor people to be able to go on those roadways. And uh, what it means on the 110 freeway, if you've seen it, is there are two lanes in each direction for their carpool lanes. It's underutilized. It's not fully utilized. So what they said is, why not utilize it more? Allow people to go that are carpooling, but for more money, people can... But with one person only, you're saying? One person right. driving. In other words, you can drive on the diamond lane by yourself, but you have to pay. You're showing your age, yeah. Diamond Lane. They don't call that anymore. Yeah. That, that was in the yeah, 70s right. or 80s, but no. Um, <laughs> I'm retro. We have to give Fernando a hard time, too. But it, it means that a couple of things. One is that money that comes in from someone who wants to drive there, guess what, goes to be, is, is going to be used for public transportation for others. That also means those people who are driving in the other four lanes that have been congested, guess what? They're going to be less congested, we think, because now they're going to be able to go on the carpool lane. But the, even the idea of, in, of allowing someone Who's to pay... Who's against this? What? Who's against this? Um, some congressional members on the 10 and some of our, you know, council members. We talked about doing it at the airport. Congestion pricing of being able to go in that circle. Yeah. Um, we actually and, made, oh, it's max it. of, um, you know, well, elitism. But you know what's interesting, because there have been a number of studies done by folks at UCLA and others in Where? terms of the university just north of here, the other one. Um, not Figueroa Tech, the other one up, <laughs> up the street. But um, the... Uh, oh, oh, the uh, you have you got that, Joe. Oh, <laughs> the, um, and what they show is that actually 
the people who use the carpool, the who who use the uh, express lane on the 91 freeway and on the 215 mirror the same population who are on the regular freeway, and that even low-income drivers still use it when they need to get somewhere quickly, and they may use it more sparingly, mm -hmm. but they still take advantage of it. You know, the one, one thing that's interesting in terms of the pay, because you raised the congestion pricing, and Wendy came up with some interesting ideas, that, uh, different models. What, what I've never quite figured out and don't know how to explain to folks or what, get a better result from, when you talk to people about increasing the gas tax and say, look, if we could increase the gas tax by a quarter, we could build the following X, Y, Z in this period of time and fix these problems and have a system that gets close to your house throughout the county. People say, not going to do it, not going there. But somehow we continue to pay more money every time some folks in the Middle East want more money out of us, yeah. where we're paying two or three bucks a gallon more, right. and we pay that because we accept it as part of going from point A to point B. But instead of that, we won't pay the, doll, the quarter no. to build a system here. It makes no sense. I know. So I, Gilbert Ivey's been very patient while we've well, been talking. Well, you know, I got to say one thing about transportation. Absolutely. One thing. Well, we'll, is, we'll let you say one thing. <laughs> talk, but I'm going to say yeah. one thing about Okay, thank you. That's enough. Let's move on. No, go ahead. Tom Bradley was my mentor. Oh, you were, you were for Tom, too? Tom Bradley was my mentor. <laughs> he inspired Metropolitan to not leave downtown Los Angeles right. with the headquarters building. So we decided to build our headquarters building at Union Station on purpose. And the reason we built it at Union Station is because it was the hub of transportation in Los Angeles. So we were able, we have 1,000 people in that particular building, and they, about 52 to 53 percent of those employees, including myself, use mass transportation, rail lines, subway, the buses, whatever. And we think that we, as an organization, have made our contribution right. to the reduction of travel yep. in this city. So let me make a point here. If I was to dump this water out, and sorry for not having just regular uh, tap retail. water. Tap water, but mm -hmm. this is Arrowhead. So, mm -hmm. and my point is this: if I were to dump this water out and fill it up with gas, and compare it to this, this bottle of water would cost four times more than this bottle of gas. That is correct. That's, right. That's how much that we pay. Correct. We pay you when every time you buy a bottle of water, you're paying four times more for that water, which is free if you right. go to right. tap, right. than you do for gas. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if people think gas is expensive. It shows you how expensive this is. That's right. Yeah. And it shows you what a great marketing scam bottled water has been. I mean, the, the growth in bottled water industry. And there was a bottled water company not too long ago that was ordered to fully disclose on their label. They had done all the initials. Yeah. And they were basically repackaging municipal water. That's correct. Right, and selling That's it as right. bottled water. I That's mean, right. there, there is a transition, by the way. You talk about driving on even and odd. Metropolitan's working on a plan. The city of L.A. is working on a plan because of the drought we're in. You're going to only be able to water your lawn like on Mondays and Thursdays in Los Angeles probably in the next couple months. Right. So there is some parallels between transportation yeah, there is a parallel and the water. Yeah, who's, going to who's going to police that? Well, that's what the, water, doing the water police. The water okay. police. Water police. It's a full employment act. We're to, it's part of the economic stimulus plan of the president. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you guys apply after you graduate you know, to the water police. Mr. Ivey, okay, <laughs> you, is there a drought right now? Is there, there is a drought, has been a drought. This entire region is drought prone. People continue to forget way, way back that this is a desert area. This is a Mediterranean desert-like environment. It's prone to having long periods and years and years of drought. What we've done, because of the forefathers of Mulholland and, and the city of Los Angeles and others, have come in and greened the Southern California area because of imported water supplies and groundwater and well water and the whole bit. So what happens if you don't know your water system, you're thinking about what a utopia this place is and what a great place to be because it's always wet. But it's wet for a reason. And that reason is that we have to bring the water in from hundreds of miles away to get it here to green this area so that you can have a water supply. And when I first started at Metropolitan way back in 1970, I was uh, from Centennial High School in Compton. And I was given an opportunity to work in Metropolitan. And I want to inspire you uh, from the standpoint of being young college students to look at a career in water because I never heard of Metropolitan, nor did I care about water. I turned on the tap, there was the water, and that's all I cared. And it wasn't until a few years later when I was making a good salary that I said, oh, maybe I should care about this, and it's a good career. But the biggest issue that we have here is that water is a precious resource. It is in short supply, and we have to figure out a way that we manage this resource so that there's enough water for all of you and your grandkids and your grandparents to have to drink. And it's in jeopardy as we speak. 
We have never been so critically low in our water supply as we have been in the recent times. We have a problem on the Colorado River, which is one of our supplies. We have a problem up north in the Sacramento, San Joaquin Bay Delta area with our supplies. We have a problem with the weather, the climate changes. Definitely something's happening there, whether you believe in it or not. Something's going with our climate, and it's causing the weather patterns to change. And it's causing problems with the habitat in the Delta area as far as migration and fish and estuaries. And it's causing problems both with people who feel that we should be protecting water supply for the fish, has problems with the people with the farmers who feel that their water should come to the farmers for agriculture, and they have problems with the growing urban environment that we're in, that there's not enough supply for the people in the cities. So there's this constant tug of war that Richard knows very well, and Wendy knows as well as a city council member and now controller, that you have factions that are always competing for the water supply. And our board is a different board than either the city council or Richard's MTA. We have 37 members of our board that come from Ventura to the Mexican border, and they represent 19 million people who drink our water. So we, here in Los Angeles, we have the DWP, the Department of Water and Power. So why do we need the MWD? How did that the happen? MW, Metro and then water I'm going to get Richard to comment on water because he's going to have to leave. But yes. answer that question, then yeah, we'll get Metro you to make some district, general comments. And then. The Metro Water District is basically formed as a wholesaler of water, a supplemental water supply. We bring in water to the entire region. So the you, M MWD does not sell water to individual houses? Not to individual. We're a wholesaler. Department of Water and Power of the City of Los Angeles is a member agency, one of 26 member agencies that make up the Metropolitan And they water buy the system. water, then sell they it to the... buy the water, and then sell it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Richard, yep. the, I mean, you've been involved in water politics. Every time there's a problem, you're involved. And so mm -hmm. we don't know whether you're the cause or the solution, but, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, what's, what's going Do we have a drought? Yeah, I mean, because there's without, been some talk lately that, nah, you know, the, the people are really making it up. Uh, and there's plenty of water. It's just how do, how do we get it here? Well, it's a combination. We are definitely in a drought. If you look at Lake Powell and Lake Mead uh, on the Colorado River, you'll see what we refer to as a bathtub ring which is about 100 feet deep, and that's 100 feet of water that's not there the entire length and distance of those facilities, which is a lot of water. And an acre foot of water is the, you know, when I first started doing water, an acre foot was defined as the amount of water a family of four uses in a year. It's the amount of water that covers an, an, an acre, acre foot. An acre foot of water is? Was. We have, because of conservation and efficiencies, we now say an acre foot of water is the amount of water two families of four use uh, in the course of a year. So we have gotten that much more efficient. One of the stories that's not known, people in the Bay Area like to talk about our swimming pools down south. The city of Los Angeles uses the same total amount of water today that it did in 1990, despite the fact that there are a million and a half more people here there there were in 1990. And that's a result of low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, low flow nozzles, drip irrigation, metropolitan water district programs working with DWP. We do have a crisis though. We have an allocation crisis to an extent. Two thirds of the water is in Northern California. Two thirds of the people are in Southern California. So, so why don't we just vote ourselves to water? Well, we, we could vote with, a, because, <laughs> Peripheral canal on the ballot 82 gets defeated yeah. because people in LA also have environmental concerns and you know it's it's how do you make it balanced? Water is a limited resource and for too long and I think you put it correctly uh, and Gil mentioned it too long it's been the fights of special interest. Mark Twain said that um, you know whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over mm -hmm. and that's pretty true in California. He was talking about California at the time and that's pretty true here. You have the competing needs of agriculture versus urban areas. And what used to be viewed as a Northern California, Southern California fight or dispute is now an East-West. It's an urban-rural difference now. And we need to do a better job of making water more efficient. We need to do a better job of conserving. Most importantly, we need to fix the ecosystem in the Delta. Levees in New Orleans were 8 to 10 feet below sea level. The islands in the Delta, and the Delta is the area between San Francisco and Stockton and Sacramento. Anybody uh, out there live in that area, the Delta? One expert. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, he looks like he's no. from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Those islands are in excess of 20 or 30 feet below sea level. So if we had a major storm or an earthquake, earthquake. that destroyed those levees, mm -hmm. we would not be able to move water from Northern California to Southern California for maybe 10 years because there's a very delicate balance that keeps the salt water from coming into the contaminating the water system. 
We have a serious, serious crisis in the Delta. Absolutely. You know there's going to be an earthquake in that area. Yeah, at some point. Yeah, yeah. And isn't one of the, the issues, you know, um, uh, the fact that we, in our water table, and we have a lot of water that goes into the ground, mm -hmm. that if it wasn't contaminated, we could use that water. Um, and so that's another big challenge for us is uh, the fact that for a variety of reasons, our groundwater is contaminated. So that is not the kind of resource that we thought many years ago we would be able to use those areas and pull the water up. That's right. That's is right. there anybody out there that is just dying to ask uh, Mr. Richard Katz a question before he leaves? Because he's got to go make a presentation. Any questions? Because we're going to have Mr. Ivey and, and Council Member Gruel with us who uh, know a lot more than him. So real loud. That's because nobody goes to Padre games, and it's, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> nobody goes to Clipper games, but that's, <laughs> yeah. One, repeat, repeat the question. Question was, why isn't, why isn't there a, uh, comprehensive. A, a comprehensive plan that includes Staples and uh, Dodger Stadium, or the Hollywood Bowl, or the Greek Theater? Because when the original subway was put together, which was before my time, for reasons that I still don't understand, they decided to bypass all those major venues where people go. It's just dumb. We are trying to correct that. One of the things we're looking at with no, the wait, there's, a, there's a stop at Staples Center, the Pico stop for the oh, there's, Blue Line. There's a stop for the Blue Line, at, for the blue yeah, the line blue and line, there's yeah. a stop at 7th and Flower at That's Metro right. Center. Yeah. You have to walk yeah, about walk. two blocks either way. Oh, no. But that, the, really? I can't, I can't take it. But, here's the, but the answer, by the way, the answer on Dodger <laughs> Stadium is that federal law precludes you from using public dollars to go into a private venue, and the Dodgers have been too cheap to pay for it. Well, they got to pay for many. Come on. Wait a minute, can I re let me take well, that back because oh. McCord's going to be really pissed when he hears. I was going to say. We've, been working with the, we've actually been working with the Dodgers to try and work out. The Dodgers have fronted money to do a signalization plan in the area around Dodger Stadium, and we're trying to work with them to get a shuttle going back up there. We ran buses for a while out of, M out of the Union Station. Okay. Didn't get as much use as we thought it would, unfortunately. The, this, but this year, actually, it, it did. This was the first year we did a little bit differently, right. and they had um, that the shuttles were much better, and they stopped along the way. They were um, buses. I, I can't. There were thousands of people that took them, uh, but again, it was who pays free. for it. It was free, and who who pays for it? And the the Dodgers feel that that the city should that, in, as you indicated, that in every major city they have public transportation there. I mean, used to be that the MTA. This was before your time there too, Richard. That the MTA had a stop that went by there, um, and uh, that is their argument. Um, we're looking at sponsorship opportunities, ways in which we can pay for those shuttles, because people are willing to take mass transit if it works, even if it takes a little bit longer. Because in the city of LA. Unless it's a rainy day or there's been a major catastrophe on the freeway, it will take you about the same time by mass transit as it would by car. But the idea is that it is a, it is, um, a much more um, enjoyable route. You're not having to use gas. It's cheaper and all of those things. Um, but when they did the Dodger, sorry, the Dodger Stadium to um, USC, excuse me, when they did the Coliseum, they did the 50th anniversary of the Dodgers, and they advertised people to take a bus instead of driving down there. The good news is thousands of people showed up. The bad news was they had no idea that thousands of people would show up, and so it took hours. Um, but it showed there was a demand for people to take that public transportation. Well, one last question while Richard is here, and then we'll go back. Yeah, Arash. Yeah, why why can't we do why can't we do as good a job as other cities at least perceived? Well, part of it is you know going back to the gentleman's question. You know, I went to Yankee Stadium last year, and there's a subway stop in the middle of the new stadium and the old stadium. You know, it's like a half a block in either direction, and the subway's jammed going to games. To answer your question, 
we do look, we have a whole cadre of planners both inside the agency but outside to look at the ideas. The, one of the problems in, in Los Angeles is that most cities that have successful transportation systems, everybody lives out here and comes in here to go to work. New York's like that, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Paris, London, everyone lives outside and comes in. If you notice in Los Angeles, the traffic going east any morning is as heavy as the traffic going west every morning. Westbound traffic on the 10, the 101, and the 118 is as heavy as the downtown traffic because we're that much more sprawled out. And what that means from a transportation planning standpoint is it's hard to get the density and the critical mass necessary to pay for the kind of systems we want to put in. That's why the MTA and the City of Los Angeles and others now are encouraging development around station locations. For instance, when we did congestion management planning, we said that you have to mitigate certain things. But if you build within a quarter mile of a transit hub, you don't have to do the mitigation to encourage that kind of infill. And the city's doing a lot now to encourage that kind of development, and that will help us build those kinds of more creative systems. Loyola Marymount University, the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We have our guest, Gil Ivey, from the Metropolitan Water District, and Councilwoman, soon-to-be controller, Wendy Gruel. And we're going to talk a little bit about water and continue to talk about infrastructure. Um, so let's continue with water, but then I'm going to want to ask the Councilwoman about our airport and our port and just infrastructure in general. I always see that the role of government is to facilitate the private sector. And we do that oftentimes by building infrastructure. We allow, for in terms of transportation, for commerce to move, which we call goods movements, but we also allow people to move. In terms of water, and one of the questions I have for you, Gil, is that if we didn't import all this water from DWP and the aqueducts that we bring or the MWD and the aqueducts and the water that they bring, what could the region sustain? You said 19 million people live in the greater LA area served by Metropolitan Water District. If MET didn't exist, if we weren't importing water, how, much, how many people could live here? If we didn't have the water supply that we have now, you would be looking at dramatically reduced population. The groundwater supply here and the water that comes through the streams in the LA River would not be sufficient to support the type of economy that's here today. In the metropolitan area from Ventura to the Mexican border, you're representing an $800 billion economy just in the metropolitan service area. You wouldn't be able to sustain that without an adequate water supply. But just to make sure the students understand, that area he just described would be the 20th largest economy in the world. Right what he just described from Ventura to uh, um, the Mexican border, That's the 20th right. largest economy in the whole world, <laughs> dependent right. on water. On water. And you, you need to understand that water is such a foundational issue that you're hearing all the things going on in the economy about the bank bailouts and this bailout and the auto bailout and, and economic stimulus. But if you don't have the foundational issue of a water supply in place that can sustain our lifestyle, then the rest of this is for no, no apparent reason to have. And Southern California is such a mecca for weather that people want to come here anyway. And so there's going to be a natural demand, as Mo Holland did way back in the early 20s, of sustaining a water supply that could support development and growth in the Southern California region. And that's why we have the Metropolitan Water District today, and that's why you have regional local water suppliers who bring uh, sustainability to uh, urban Southern California. One of the biggest challenges we have, again, as we mentioned before, is this issue between agriculture and the need that they have to grow the breadbasket of America as we have in the Central Valley, and then the growth of urban America, especially with the fact that right now we are enjoying 220,000 people a year growth in our Southern California region. So when you have that kind of growth, even though the economy is going south on us, that uh, you have to be able to sustain that. And some of the issues that are coming forth now are recycling water, groundwater cleanup, as Wendy has mentioned before, ways we can conserve in a very aggressive way, uh, cutbacks on use of water, not being able to water your lawns as often as you do now, wash your cars, taking showers, as, uh, shorter showers, and, and all that is going to have to be an equation that we're doing here before the rest of the state, and especially in the area of the environmentalists up north, they want to be shown that Southern California is doing every single thing possible before we look back to the other areas to try to bring water 
into our region, and that's a big challenge. Yeah, so we talked in class uh, last week or the week before about the Hyperion water treatment plant that the city of Los Angeles owns. Water goes over there, it's treated, and that's the water that came from the shower or from the toilet or what have you, that's right. and that it's treated so well that you could actually drink it, but of course, nobody wants to drink toilet water. And so what we try to use that water for is, actually we have a pipeline from the Hyperion to Loyola Marymount, yes. and we um, use it to irrigate. That's so right. we could use it also to wash cars and all that type Absolutely. of thing. So do you ever think that we'll get to the position where we have to use recycled water for drinking or for taking a shower? Absolutely. And how do you sell that to these folks? A good place where this is occurring down is Orange County. Orange County has a very uh, successful program. I knew that, the Orange people. Yes, the Orange, they, Orange County people, they, they just do it. And they have a, a very successful program. And, you know, it, it was always this issue about toilet to tap, I think, yeah. is the program you were referring to. And we like to look at it more like showers to flowers, kind of, uh, of a better <laughs> way to, to look at that. And it's necessary. And let me tell you, the water that's treated is just as good quality as the drinking water. And you have to think about, think about your hydrology and think about geology and the fact that the water we're drinking today is the same water the dinosaurs drank way back in prehistoric times. The water you're drinking today is coming from Lake Mead or up north, and it's the same water that Las Vegas were using. It's the same water that other cities are using, the fishermen are using, and the fish are swimming around in, and it gets treated by our very sophisticated processes, and it is clean and pure. And the same thing happens with the treated water from Hyperion and other sewage plants, and that water is good enough for drinking. I think it's going to be the psychology, it's going to be the pricing of water, it's going to be the fact that Southern Californians are going to demand a water supply, and recycling is going to be the answer. It is going to be a so you say pricing. The, we, Richard already talked about Proposition R and the taxes and how much more we're going to pay. Are we going to be paying more for water in the future? We are going to be paying more for water in the future, but water is still the cheapest, absolutely the cheapest a uh, resource that you can you can uh, acquire right now is cheaper than your cable television. It's cheaper than absolutely everything you could use. Water is a it, it is just a commodity that need, it's a resource that needs to be revered and and treated well. And one of the things that has to happen, of course, is the fact that a way to change behavior, of course, as you all know, and especially in your classes, is pricing. And when you finally price water at a level that really gets the attention of people, there'll be a natural conservation, there'll be a rush to do things separately. Uh, desalinization is a good example. It's a very expensive way to treat water, but at a certain price, then it's an economic way. Recycling is another way. Groundwater cleanup is going to be costly, and we're going to have to raise water rates to the point where we can pay for these programs. And are we done with major big projects for Metropolitan Water District in terms of building another aqueduct or anything of that nature, or is there, are there plans in the future for that? There are plans in the future, especially in the state water project at, up in the San, Sacramento San Joaquin Valley area, that there's a need to fix the delta. It's a huge problem. That's where a major water supply resource of water comes from for Southern California, as well as the Bay Area up north in the Central Valley. And there are some fixes in there that are going to cost in the billions. Got to fix those levees that are made up of nothing more than peat moss. And that peat moss is very fragile, very chalky, and it, it can't sustain its own weight. So that's what the levees are being built with that is protecting the water supply and the fish. But in earthquake, and we believe that scientists are telling us that there's a 60% or more chance of a major earthquake hitting in the delta. And when that earthquake happens, you're going to have a Katrina-like situation where those valleys and those, those islands that are in there that are 30 feet below sea level, the levees up to 22 islands will fail. The waters will inundate those islands, part of which is where we get the drinking water supply because we're using the le islands and the levees to bring our drinking water down from uh, Northern California. The seawater will then come in from the San Francisco Bay to fill in the voids that the islands have created where the water's rushing in, and we will no longer be able to take water out of that area because it would be inundated by salt water. And that is a major supply for this area. And the only way we're going to be able to protect that is we've got to fix it. We've got to come up with a different way to treat that issue. And some of the debate that's going on is with the environmentalists and wanting to protect the delta area for the fish and the wildlife there, which is a wonderful cause. The, the agriculture that wants to be able to have enough water to come in and treat, uh, supply water to the fields for agriculture and, of course, for urban Southern California, Central and Northern California. So the only way we're going to get that done is we're going to have to do a collaboration of the, everyone. And it's going to take the business community, it's going to take labor, it's going to take the environmentalists, which we're working on now in a collaboration to bring this all together to get the attention of the state legislature and the governor to work together to say, fix it. We need this stuff fixed. 
and we need it fixed now before it's too late. You, uh, and Wendy, you hear Gil talk and it, all these different stakeholders and all that, and you previously heard uh, Richard Katz talk about Robert Moses, who was a great builder. It, it's just there isn't anybody anymore, not the mayor, not the governor, who can say, I'm going to do this. It takes really a consensus which then drags things out, makes things cost a lot more. Um, are you familiar, since you've been in public office, one issue that really moved fast and what were the factors with that? Or is it just always going to take a long time to do anything in terms of public policy? Prices. People. Five ten freeways. Collapse. Collapse. Literally. Happened that that was built very Instruction people to finish it got done, the environmental work, everything was, was mm -hmm. and what we have to do is change the mentality to say we are talked about toilet to tap, probably eight Politicians stood there, as you know, Richard talked about people who are um, actually going to be, um, you know, have a leadership role. Uh, the importance of, of standing up and saying, you know, it's really not toilet to tap. It's there are all kinds of reasons why it would work, but that put the the whole issue of recycle using recyclable water back for that 10-year period of time. It was only until recently, last year, we did a press conference out um, at uh, one of the sites in the San Fernando Valley um, where the mayor put forward a proposal that said, we are going to look at ways to use recycled water. And the, the thoughts of the past, the, um, I, I think the discrimination of what we were looking at is going to be different now because people realize that treatment is, is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. you, you talked previously about, I mean, you had a great job. Uh, DreamWorks. Why did you? I give would have been located right over here. Yeah. yeah. Why, why did you give that up to go into public life? Well, um, you know, I worked for DreamWorks for about four and a half years, and when Joel Wax decided to retire early, my friends all came to me and said, "When do you need to run?" I was like, "Okay, I have a mortgage. I I have a great job, um, but this is really a privilege to serve as an elected official." And I understood that I had an opportunity to make a difference. Um, in a community I had lived in for a very long time and that I could use my both private sector and public spe sector experience to, to change the way government operated. And if I won, that was great. If I lost, you know, I would be still able to, I still had my job, at least after the primary. After the, I mean, before the primary. After the primary, my boss and I had that conversation that I'd probably grown out of my job. Um, and so it was a little scary. Oh, well, that's thinking, a great way. And I got to remember that when I want to fire somebody. Hey, you've grown out of your job. <laughs> you've grown out of your job. So, uh, they were very supportive. Um, they did fundraisers for me and helped me, but I think we, we thought, okay, after that, we're going to go on. So that's very frightening. Do women politicians govern differently than male politicians? Oh, I could spend an entire hour on that. Um, yes, we do. How, um, how, how do you see that? How does that manifest itself? Well, um, one, uh, most of the time we are, we are consensus builders um, in doing this and that there are very few, unfortunately, women in elective office. In the city council, we currently have three members out of 15. It used to be five out of 15. Laura Chick, who's a current controller, was the first woman to ever be a citywide elected official in the history of the city of Los Angeles. I'm only the third woman in the history of Los Angeles to have a child while in office. The first one was 50 years ago. The last one was 20 years ago. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of barriers to women getting into elected office. Uh, many women have chosen to go in after they have finished their you know, um, raising their, their children. Um, but uh, what we're, we're seeing more is women understanding that they can make and make a difference. But the challenges, and this came up in this last election, which just angered me to no end. The debate was whether I was too nice to be the city controller. Was I mean enough? She's and I mean. She's mean. <laughs> she's mean. <laughs> yeah, you see that roast, I was mean. Um, but, you know, I said, you don't ask the guys that question. You don't ask the we guys. Know they're, we know they're mean. Yeah. We know they're mean. No, that's, see, did you know Fernando, you know, was uh, a sexist in his uh, opinions here? Um, but oh. just kidding. Oh, throw it out. No, they just already, kidding. they know that. They know that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a surprise. <laughs>
Just kidding you, Fernando. Um, but it, it is, uh, you know, women are sometimes held to a much higher standard. Um, we operate differently from a political perspective, and, and we've had this conversation before too, Fernando, where the guys, when they have someone, um, uh, they all rally around that particular person, they clear the field, they raise the money, they've got a bench, they've got people ready to go. Women kind of say in a democratic process, let's look and see, they don't, they don't support, women don't support women as much as they should. They don't raise as much money. Okay, um, well, let me ask you this then. You will become controller on July 1st, which you resign your council position midterm. You had four years, you only the second year. There will then be a special election held sometime in what, August, September, somewhere around there. Are you going to try to recruit a woman to run and replace you? Well, there are several women who are, are, run, are at least considering running. Um, the, it has not been um, determined when the actual election is going to be, so everyone is just kind of jockeying. Um, on a daily basis, I get someone else like who's decided. Like 180 days, doesn't the law require that it be? Until I vacate. Right, when you vacate, but then it, the law requires yes. that within. So it would be September, October. Right. And um, uh, the, uh, if, if all the people who have decided to run now run, there's going to be a runoff, because there's seven or eight people who can you know, raise some money to do that. Um, I've encouraged women to run. I think it is important um, to be able to have. Does that mean, and I think this is a very important distinction, have I always supported the woman over the guy? No. I've supported who I thought was the best candidate. Um, and if, if we can make sure there is a woman, but we need to do more, and I've talked to a number of, of elected officials who are women, about recruiting women, supporting women, doing the same thing the guys do, which is we will help raise you the money, we will get you into those places, and, and we will become your mentors, um, because that is critically important to do. You know, when I first started teaching here at Loyola Marymount and actually doing research and writing, I wrote quite a bit about Latinos and African Americans and gaining political power. Mm -hmm. And I, and I used to make, uh, had the hypothesis or the argument that when a majority of governing bodies would become Latino or African American or the combination, that public policy would change, that outcomes would change. And after 25 years of looking at that, I've concluded that I was wrong. I was way wrong, okay? It hasn't changed. As a matter of fact, the system changed the electeds. Now, collect, uh, and so collectively, I think there's been a tremendous failure collectively amongst African American and Latino elected officials. Individually, it's hard for me to blame any one of them. Uh, uh, but so now my new hypothesis is that when women are the majority of a governing body, they will change how politics will uh, um, be practiced and how public policy will be made. What do you think about that? I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I think that, um, you know, Karen Bass, who is the, you know, um, Speaker of the Assembly, first African American woman in, in the country to head a legislature. First African American woman. And you have not seen, I mean, you can criticize both sides of how, why the state legislature is in such disarray, mm -hmm. but from a perspective of getting things, we have not seen the kind of infighting in the Democratic Party. You know, we've seen, she has been able to bring people together. She has shown that you can be a nice person and you can be tough. Um, I think it was Jennifer Granholm, who's the governor of Michigan, who said, do not, you know, s think that civility means you cannot be tough. Do not confuse those two. Um, and so I, I, I think you're right that there is that opportunity to change um, and where a woman takes a different perspective. But there are stereotypes out there of women still today. Um, and I get reminded of that on numerous occasions, and particularly being a parent. Um, how many people think that women cannot um, function um, you should be at home taking care of your child that instead is right. of, uh, so, yeah. Oh, no, I went to a meeting, um, and uh, they write questions. It's one meeting as you go and speak, and then they write questions on a piece of paper, and then you're supposed to answer those, and those that you um, are not able to answer during the time period in which you're speaking, you, they'll give you to take home and respond to. And literally someone wrote on this questionnaire um, in the midst of another question uh, about homelessness or something said, and why don't you go home and be a real mom to your child? And I, I, my breath was taken away when I read that, you know, and my husband and I had a disagreement of whether it was a woman or a man who wrote it, because of course it was anonymous. Um, but you... So you were arguing what, that it was a woman or a man that wrote it? I, of course, thought it was a man. My <laughs> husband thought it was a woman. Um, but you, um, and I think I particularly hear more criticism um, of uh, 
how can you do it all because I'm an elected official? So they, people feel free to send you emails and, and say things to you that they would never say to someone else, a coworker or otherwise. Um, so I'm, I maybe get a, a stronger sense of that. Uh, but I, I say to people, women do it every single day. Um, and it's, it's just because I'm an, an elected office that I'm, I'm much more um, visible on that. But um, we can do it, and there's shared responsibilities that exist today. So my, my opposite hypothesis that women will come in and change the world and the public policy is that men have so screwed it up and created so many institutional obstacles that not even Wonder Woman could change it. And my example here is LA Unified. The, in July, uh, there are seven board members of LA Unified. Five of the seven will be women, okay? A super majority, okay? Can they change and turn LA Unified around? And I just, when I look at what an uh, incredible challenge is and how we've screwed it up, I just don't, I, I don't think so. What's your reaction to well, that? Well, I think when LAUSD has been one of the entities that has had more women on there than others, because that was how, stereotypical, how you got involved in politics was you weren't ready quite to be, you know, a city council member or state legislature. You were the ones that go to the school board. So you'll see many more women on school boards than you will any, anywhere else. Um, but I think that um, what we have found is the women um, who are now on the, on the school board are really going to um, change things. Because, and not, nothing against the people who have been there before, but some of these elected officials have been there for 20, 25 years. Systems have changed. I, I support um, term limits. I don't think, I, I think where they are in the state legislature have, has ruined the state legislature. Uh, but I, I do think if someone's been in office 20, 30 years, um, their experience and the reason why you would think they should be there for a long period of time suddenly wanes in comparison to um, the fact that they are you, doing the same things the same way for all, you know, for all of that like 20, around 30 12 years. Like around 12 years like it is at the like City Council. I, I think 12 years, which we did here in the City Council, is a very good time in which uh, to be able to make change but not get stale in what you're doing. Um, and uh, the school district has changed dramatically from when some of these school board members uh, were there 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you know, what, I might say something ahead, too about please. the MW board. We typically only had one woman. Out of 37? Out of a, well, we used to have 52 members, 51 members on our right, board. Right. And um, we're now up to, I think, seven to eight women coming on board now. And I have to tell you, since I've been there so long and I've worked with this board, that the woman board member is bringing a whole different dynamic to that board. It used to be kind of an insulated in-game type of issue with primarily all white male. Well, that's what I was going to ask level. you, that yeah. for, for you to be a high administrator in a water agency, it's very unusual in terms of African Americans. There's that old term about water buffaloes, which yes. was the first time I ever went to a metropolitan water district meeting or first time I ever went to a water conference, it was all white males. Not only white males, but old. I mean, they were there like forever. <laughs> gray hairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're gray hairs, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, that, and that is a true statement. They used to be developers, bankers, oil men, and that was what helped build the Metropolitan Water District in Southern California. So you, you don't fault them. We thank them for where we are today. But being reality, things have changed. Politics have changed. And uh, the dynamics of the boardroom have changed. So you're now getting a more of a working class board member, someone who's dealing with day-to-day -day life as opposed to a wealthier person who dealt with a wealthy life. And so it's changing the politics of, of water. And <clears throat> women coming into the boardroom now is changing how we approach decision making and how we go forward. It's quite a refreshing change. It's a necessary change. And mixing that in with the minorities we also have on the board, African Americans and, his, and Latinos we have on the board, I think you have a great dynamic group now that is really going to forge a whole new frontier for water into the future for all of us uh, to take advantage of. My, my background at Metropolitan was I was hired uh, to be a, an engineering aide, so to speak, but my real job was chauffeuring the women around who were not allowed to drive the company cars uh, for Metropolitan. I, I mean, that was 1970, so it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> and the only thing Met had in common with women and blacks was the Supremes, because uh, they would buy the records. So then, you know, that's, that's kind of sad. And uh, so here we are today, where I made it from the bottom, basically, to uh -huh. where I am today. And I do want to correct, I'm not interim CEO right now. I was interim CEO, I'm Chief Administrative Officer. But uh, where we are today, I think, is a testament that over time, time heals, time shows, that there's no reason to fear and that we can progress on and that's why uh, where we are today in the presidential situation is also so refreshing. 
Okay, I have only two more questions for Councilwoman uh, Wendy Grohl, then I'm gonna let you guys ask some questions. Uh, what's your greatest accomplishment as a council member? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, business tax reform and people, oh, that's so dry, you know, what does that, what does that mean um, in the city? Uh, but if you wanna have a strong and vibrant city, you need to have a strong economy and you need to be able to create jobs. Um, and we were seeing a lot of our businesses go to surrounding cities, Burbank, Glendale, Culver City, um, Siena Monica, other places that either had a better way of doing business or two did not um, uh, have you pay business taxes. And so we did a landmark um, a business tax reform in the city of Los Angeles where we reduced business tax overall at 15 percent. We're trying to go up to 25 percent and we simplified the, the system in Los Angeles. Um, that, uh, and, and if you were a small business of gross receipts of $100,000 or less, you no longer pay business tax in the city of Los Angeles. That was 60 percent of the businesses. Um, and that was something that people told me we couldn't do. Um, and I said, this is something that, and, and my, just my other kind of accomplishment I will, I will tell you is preserving open space because that will be saved in perpetuity. Over a thousand acres um, in the Verdugo Mountains um, will be saved in perpetuity because of agreements I reached with developers to donate that land or purchasing land using city money and leveraging um, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy dollars, county money, um, and that really is a legacy I'm excited about. And before I ask the next question, if you want to ask a question, why don't you guys, whoever wants to ask a question, come on, line up over here. So, and I'll be looking for my students to do that for extra credit. Uh, anyway. Um, I don't know, did they hear that? Did they hear that part, extra credit if you stand in line? Okay. So, uh, some of them, I just gave the midterms back. Some of them should take up the offer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how will we know in four years, whether you were a successful controller or not, what are the metrics that we should use to um, to assess your performance? That's a very good question, and something that um, I and mean, I, I won the election just a month ago, but I feel as though yeah, what have you done for us lately? I know <laughs> oof, a lifetime um, as I'm uh, preparing to take office in three months, uh, but I, I think it's going to be a couple things. One is that I have performed audits that um, have outlined where we can uh, run the city more efficiently and where we've saved money and literally be able to calculate how much money we've saved, um, to hold um, our mayor and city council accountable for decisions that they have made and, and to make sure that um, as, a, as the fiscal agent in the city uh, that uh, we are also looking beyond next year and the year after to look at best practices across the country. So I think you can gauge it on um, the kinds of audits that I've released and the issues that I've addressed, and secondly, how much money we've been able to save and project by a city control. Uh, Kevin. Hi, how's it going? Uh, my question is for you, Ms. Gruel. Um, earlier, we were talking about progressive public policy and uh, the appointment of kind of a contractor, a private contractor who is specialized in an area and using that to fix problems, like it was used in LA for the Olympics. And um, you look at New York and Robert Moses, kind of a benevolent, benevolent dictator who goes in and does what it takes to fix the problem with fiscal autonomy and kind of political autonomy. What would it take for Los Angeles to do that for our, our problem with traffic? Because, I mean, by evidence, like the traffic that we have now is pretty bad. Why, why aren't they taking those steps to create that type of policy? Yeah, why can't we have a traffic czar and some and, and it's kind of like you know at the in the Olympics we appointed Peter Uberoff, mm -hmm. who wasn't really a public official he was kind of quasi we gave him the autonomy and why why can't we do something like that to get things done? Well, I, I think uh, one as I described earlier that um, even with the um, consolidation that Richard Katz helped do when he was assembly member, putting the LACTD, LACTC and RTD together. Um, the fact that we have Caltrans and we have the MTA, um, that we have the city of Los Angeles and trying to combine them. And, and we're really trying to, again, I think in, in recent memory to me, this is the first time we have had not only money, um, but an agreement that the crisis has gotten so bad we have to, to do something. I'll give you one example where our mayor actually took on the subway to the sea. Um, it, was, it was dead, it was gone. 20 years ago, elected because of the, um, on uh, Wilshire Boulevard, there was a Ross Dress for Less. Um, methane gas right. exploded um, at that Ross Dress for Less, and plans for the subway down Wilshire Boulevard that we would be riding it today um, stopped, dead stop, because 
people said, and there was federal legislation that was actually put in place that said no federal money can ever be used to put a, a subway on Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah, but that was because <coughs> the local legislators didn't want the subway to go through because the community didn't want it. People in they may have the used the methane gas. Yeah, they as used the, the methane gas. So I think there was a terrorist attack on Ross for. I mean, it wasn't a fashion <laughs> statement. It was I just. I thought it was a, your barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what happened is, you know, um, and, and um, the mayor said, "Okay, we need to have the subway to the sea." That was 20 years ago. Um, technology has changed. Public, the traffic has gotten so bad, people are willing to do that. And so, put together five experts on methane gas and how to tunnel. And they came up with a report that said there's no reason you cannot tunnel down Wilshire Boulevard. Went to the federal government. Literally, it did take us two years, but we got legislation passed by the federal government that actually rescinded the previous legislation and said you can use federal money to do the subway to the sea. Um, and it may be controversial because not everyone thinks um, we should spend money on very expensive subways. Uh, but. Um, in Los Angeles, people are not taking the buses. Even, even, I mean, they will in some instances, like the Orange Line in the San Fernando Valley, where um, they thought maybe 5,000 people a day would take that Orange Line bus. 26,000 people a day take that bus for a couple of reasons. It's a dedicated bus lane. The buses do not look like the normal buses. Um, they look almost like a rail line because of their design. Um, and so we have to understand in Los Angeles that it's going to take both subway and busway and, and others. Um, but um, I think it's unfortunate that we can't wave that magic wand, but if, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a time in Los Angeles where we can do things differently to take the bull by the horns in an economic crisis and change people's behaviors and willingness to accept construction down Wilshire or Expo Line or whatever it may be, now is the time. And if we don't as leaders stand up and say we're going to do this regardless of some of the political um, challenges we will have, then we shouldn't be in office. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of our biggest challenges with other electeds. Daryl? Good question. Hi, Mr. Ivey. Um, I'm a huge advocate for tap water, and I applaud your decision to reject the bottled water. Yeah, don't, um, I don't know if you guys noticed that. He wouldn't drink the bottled water. I did not. And we had to go get him some uh, tap water. Uh, one of the questions that I'm always asking is, what can we do to ensure to the public that LA's tap water is, is safe and and that our infrastructure is, is excellent um, so that we don't have to be handing our money to bottled water corporations who are profiting off of our water? You know, that's a very good question. And part of the problem here in Southern California is we have a lot of, of, of folks from other areas that have come in with that belief that the water they drank from where they came from is unsafe, could kill them, make them sick. And the part of the public education process we have to do is going to have to continue to outreach to the communities and let them know that the drinking water that is coming out of that tap is safe, in fact, is fresh, is delicious. And LA Water, Metropolitan Water, we continue to win awards for the best and safest drinking water in the nation. We just won it last year, both LA and, and Metropolitan combined. And one of the things we have to continue to communicate is that for the dollars that you're spending on bottled water, that's money that could go to spend to pay for your electricity. That's money that could go to spend for a loaf of bread or tortillas or whatever it is for the family. And, st and what's happening now is primarily the poorer communities are buying more bottled water than Beverly Hills yeah. because of the fact that they feel it's unsafe. And all we have to do is continue to outreach to prove to people that, hey, it may be pretty to have a nice bottle like that, but this is a cheaper way to go, and and we're going to continue to push that. So even though you, you know, upstaged me today. And I did, and I'm telling you that that we need to let people know, let your parents know, let your families know, and it can, it's going to start with you. Let them know, let your friends know that hey, you know how much you pay for that. You know, if you save two of those bottles, we go see a movie. So, I mean, that's how expensive bottled water is, and you have to get real with it. You can't say that, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be homeless, I can't pay the rent, and you open up the pantry or open up your garage, and there's like cases and cases of bottled water in there you just spent the rent on. So that is, it's going to take all of us together to, to, to prove this point. Yeah, I thank, thank you. you for that. Yeah. Hey, let's give a Loyola Marymount University thank you.